Well, guys, like you know, the theme here is level up. The next person to come up on this stage is going to help you level up, level up your understanding of Bitcoin. And I'm going to get him straight up here because there is no second best second speaker. Jack Mallers. All right, what's going on, Prague? How are you guys? This is, a, this is an amazing conference. Shout out the conference. I appreciate you guys having me. And uh, when they asked me to do a keynote, I didn't really know what to present. Uh, I wasn't sure. And uh, over the last few weeks in the recent bull run and the recent potential altcoin ETF proposals, I've gotten a lot of questions, again, as I'm sure we all have in Bitcoin, of, hey, what's the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum? What's the difference between Bitcoin and an altcoin? Is there going to be a flippening? Is Bitcoin MySpace and altcoins like Solana, Facebook? And so what I decided to do, uh, very ambitiously potentially, um, is give a talk titled, There is No Second Best, and do an extreme deep dive into the difference between Bitcoin and every single other cryptocurrency. Um, I will warn you, this is a strange talk and a very ambitious talk, but we're going to do it together. Fair game? Fair game. Okay, so... I know deep in my heart and in my brain that there's a huge difference between Bitcoin and something like Ethereum or Solana or BNB token or Ton coin. Of course I know that. But I thought, how am I going to be able to explain that in 30 minutes? So I went on to CoinMarketCap and I looked at the top 10 coins, all of these coins. And I'm not going to be derogatory. This is really about science, explanation, truth, not about being mean. So I'm looking at these things, and I thought, hold on a second. <laughs> Outside of Dogecoin, which is invented to be a joke, Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency that uses proof of work. I couldn't believe my eyes in that. Ethereum doesn't use proof of work. Solana doesn't use proof of work. Cardano doesn't use proof of work. And we know this is a recent email that we got from Satoshi Nakamoto, where Satoshi writes, unfortunately, proof of work is the only solution I've found to make P2P eCash work without a trusted third party. Even if it wasn't using it for a secondarily of a way to allocate the initial distribution of the currency, proof of work is fundamental to coordinating the network and prevent double spending. So I thought to myself, okay, the best way to understand the difference between Bitcoin and the rest of the cryptocurrency world is through proof of work. So I love this quote from my friend Gigi, a failure to understand proof of work is a failure to understand Bitcoin. If we can all understand proof of work, we can then understand the difference between Bitcoin in everything else. So here's the plan. We just got through the introduction. That part was easy, right? Next, we're going to try and deeply understand proof of work. Then we're going to understand how Satoshi invented Bitcoin with proof of work. And then we're going to look at why altcoins have to be different than Bitcoin because they don't use proof of work. Fair game? Fair game. Chapter one, proof of work, a physical leap into the digital realm. To understand proof of work, we have to understand the digital age that we all live in today. The computer screen is a magic window, but it can only reflect back what we put into it. We should not mistake the reflection 
for reality itself. Virtual representations of reality are not reality itself. They are abstractions. This is a very important point. They help us understand the real world, but they themselves aren't physically real, right? Are you guys familiar with this idea that the map is not the territory, right? The map is a depiction of the territory. The map is the abstraction of the territory. But the map isn't actually the territory. Our thoughts, ideas, beliefs, perceptions of something is not the thing itself, right? We must not confuse the map with the territory. Digital tools can map our world and offer new perspectives, but they remain tools, not substitutes, for the world that they map. A simple way to think about it is that the menu is not the meal. <laughs> when I go into a steakhouse, the picture of the ribeye is an abstraction of the ribeye. I can't eat the menu, though. I have to order the ribeye, right? The virtual realm is an abstraction. Cyberspace is not physical reality, okay? One of the best ways to understand this is actually through Shakespeare, okay? So Shakespeare comes up with brilliant ideas in his mind, right? Comes up with an idea in his head, let's say Romeo and Juliet. He writes this idea down in a complex scripted language, okay? So he writes it down into a script, and he hands that script to actors to execute his idea, right? And the actors do. The actors execute the idea perfectly in front of everyone. The actors are real. The stage that they're acting on is real. The auditorium that everyone's going to watch it in is real. The emotions that you feel when you watch it are real. But are Romeo and Juliet real? No. Romeo and Juliet is an abstracted fictional story, a figment of Shakespeare's imagination, right? Same thing with the computer programmer. A computer programmer comes up with an idea. He or she writes it down in a complex scripted language. They hand it to a computer and the computer executes the idea, just like an actor plays out a figment of Shakespeare's imagination. The hardware of the computer is real, the computations are real, but the experiences we create with computers are abstracts of our mind. This is a crazy, trippy thing to think about. Um, computers are simply state machines. That's all they are. And the crazy thing to try and conceptualize and understand is that us human beings effectively figured out a way to apply abstract meaning to circuits. And then we get those circuits to repeat that significance back at us. So, for example, those of you that are physically with me in Prague you are viewing the physical me, the physical Jack, the atoms that comprise me. Where's the camera? Those of you that are watching me on the internet, you are not viewing the physical me. You are viewing an abstraction of me performed by a state machine, which we call a computer. Now, you're probably confident that the physical me was here in Prague, but I don't know. Maybe one, 10, 20 years from now, with the development of AI, you can't be so sure. So all of you in the crowd are viewing the physical me. All of you on the internet are viewing an abstraction. Does that make sense? Okay, how many of you can see this triangle? Show of hands. So there is no triangle. Right? This is what's called reification. Reification is when we take something abstract, like these abstractions that we're talking about, and we treat it as if it's a real physical thing. There is no triangle. 
There's the triangular shape is made up of the circles that surround it, but the triangle shape itself is an abstraction. It's not real. We do this to make it easier to understand abstractions by using simple everyday comparisons. So what's another example? What is this? We call this a folder, right? But there's no actual folder. We call it a folder. What is this? A document or a file. But there's no file. On the internet, when you make friends or you like post or you poke someone on social media, you're not actually poking them. This is an abstraction and we're, we're treating these abstractions as if they're real physical things. So now I'm going to play a clip from a movie that I think you guys will recognize. Do not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. There is no spoon? Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends. It is only yourself. The Oracle will see you now. You guys recognize that movie? There is no spoon. <laughs> right? In computing, this is actually correct. There is no spoon, only the abstraction that represents our perception. The point is nothing in cyberspace physically like this exists. There is no spoon. The reason you can't see the real power of digital technology is because its power is in its own abstraction. It's not in the specific algorithms, hardware, or software, but in the layer of reality we build on top of them. So we live in a virtual age. We live in a world of abstractions. Why does this matter? Why did I just spend the beginning of this trying to tell you that nothing in cyberspace is physically real? Because in an abstracted world brings abstracted power, okay? The story of The Matrix, the movie of the scene I just showed you, is that Neo realizes that software is simply an abstraction and nothing in the matrix is real. Once you realize that none of it is real, then you can exploit it. From that point, and this is the most important part, there were no physical limitations to Neo's power. Okay? Now that was a movie. Let me make it more real for you. You guys recognize this guy? He's a popular fellow, right? This guy might look familiar, and this is a man with tremendous amounts of abstract power in our abstract world. Why? Mark is the CEO of Meta, formerly Facebook, and it's one of the most popular social media platforms in the world. We live in a digital age and get all of our information, store all of our information, find love, build relationships, in this abstracted world. Mark can change the way we think, the way we act, the way we relate to each other. Mark w yields a lot of abstracted power in the digital age. But this is a very important subtle point. Mark has no physical power over any of you. Mark doesn't punch me in the face and say, you need to believe this, right? It's not physical. However, there are no physical constraints to Mark's power. Do you understand? So abstract power is intangible and often unchecked. So something like social media and something like central banking. So abstract power, 
Its pros are that it's very efficient, it doesn't require a lot of energy, and it's injury free, it's very safe. The cons are that it's not everyone has easy access to abstract power. Not everyone has an honest defense, so all of us can't defend ourselves from Mark's abstract power. It's invisible and hard to validate because it's not physically real. It lacks physical boundaries. It has no connection to the physical world. It can be exploited because of these characteristics. The power comes from within the system itself. Mark's power does not come from the fact that he could bench press 400 pounds. It comes from his power and connection to the abstracted world. There's a lot of trust required for abstracted power. It relies heavily on trust, and history shows that that trust can be broken, and it's dependent on leadership. So this abstracted world with abstracted power, all these rules are systems that rely on trust, and it relies on the fact that people will not exploit that trust. Now, uh, as someone once said, the root problem is that all the trust that's required to make it work. Uh, in history, there's breaches of that trust, right? Um, you guys might recognize that quote, but we'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so then what is real in the world? Well, we're real, right? Humans are real. Human evolution is real. Darwinism is real. Natural selection is real, right? The very atoms in our body that make us up is physically real. Let me give you an example. Um, this is a pack of wolves, right? Wolves live in packs with clear social hierarchy. The alphas who control the wolf pack are those with the most physical power, real power. Not like Mark's power, real physical power. If I were to throw a steak in front of these wolves, <laughs> the one that would eat it is the one that's probably most physically dominant, right? So wolves, as an example, are the opposite of Mark. Wolves threaten physical power over you. If you guys are hiking and you see a pack of wolves, you run away because they're going to physically harm you. But there are physical constraints to wolves' power, right? If you had a weapon, you can physically harm the wolf back. Does that make sense? So physical power is the opposite of abstract power. It's tangible and it's bound to the laws of physics. So think military, think physical assets like gold. So we have abstract power, which is intangible and often unchecked. And abstract power has a few pros in that it's energy and efficient and it's injury free, but it has a lot of cons and requires a lot of trust. What's the difference for physical power? Physical power is very inclusive. Everyone has access to physical power. Everyone has access to watts. Everyone has access to energy. Physical power isn't restricted by any limits, so we all can harness and summon any amount of physical power we want. It's externally derived from a system. It's decentralized, so physical power is physically decentralized, literally, like to the atoms in the universe. It's verifiable and tangible. We can physically see the physical power and we can physically verify it ourselves. It's quick results and it's historically reliable. So, what are the cons? Physical power is often high energy. It's energy intensive. Like running a military is energy intensive. Fighting off a pack of wolves, you'll burn a lot of calories, right? And then it also is risk of injury. Physical power is oftentimes unsafe. So war, when nation states fight in war, that's physical power, right? But physical power is dangerous and it's often a lot of blood and oftentimes a lot of human death. Right? Pros and cons. Abstract power, physical power. Now, a good example is this guy. You guys recognize this guy? I know I'm in Europe. Do you know who this is? This is Jerome Powell. So the US dollar is a phenomenal example of something that was once proof of power with physical constraints and is now abstracted power with no physical limits, right? Because when the US dollar was on the gold standard, it was tangible and bound by physical laws. When the US dollar left the gold standard and entered the fiat standard, it made it intangible, unchecked, not linked to physical reality and unbounded in its abstract power. Does that make sense? 
So what's a real world example today? When the US sanctioned Russia, Russia got 51% attacked via abstract power, right? The US was able to inflict power on Russia by removing them from the financial system. And it was very energy efficient. It was very safe. There was no, there's no bombs, there was no guns, there was no anything. Um, but that was abstract power, right? So it happened, so like I said, it was, it was efficient, it was injury free, but a lot of trust that was previously had was broken. And also in abstract power, you're dealing with subjective truths. If you ask someone in the US if that was a good thing, maybe you'll say, they'll say yes. If you ask someone in the other side of the world, maybe they'll say no. There's, it's not objective truth, it's subjective. What's an example of physical power Hitler, for example, tried to 51% attack humanity. <laughs> this is an example of physical power. Hitler wasn't able to achieve that. Why? Because of physical power. Because honest actors in the world were able to summon enough physical power to defend ourselves and thwart off a malicious actor that was trying to 51% attack planet Earth. Does that make sense? So abstract power, physical power. So Gold standard physical reality. Abstract reality is when we are on the fiat standard. There's physical constraints, abstract constraints, right? Does that make sense? Now, the problem in all of this, I promise this is the longest section. Unfortunately, it's impossible to apply real world limits and constraints to an abstracted virtual world until this guy is Adam in the crowd. So before Adam back, it was impossible to apply real world limits and constraints to an abstracted virtual world. Adam attempted to solve this problem of email spam, okay? And I want you guys to watch this clip of Adam describing creating his invention. Uh, I was interested in privacy technology and uh, so I was running a remailer, which is a way to send anonymous email and I guess more importantly, to also send anonymous comments to Usenet, which is itself a distributed kind of email-like discussion forum. And so there's a kind of denial of service amplification there. The denial of service amplification is basically that, you know, the attacker can do something and some part of the system itself will do many thousands of copies of what they did. So if you find a denial of service amplification, you can kind of cause the system to strain without doing that much work yourself. So I don't know if you guys could hear that, but this part was the important part. Adam said, you can cause the system to strain without doing that much work yourself. Did you guys catch that part? What does that remind you of? That reminds me of her. This is the Treasury of the United States. This is Janet Yellen. The US printing money can cause the system a lot of strain without doing any work themselves, right? They can cause a lot of inflation and strain on all of us without doing any work. Reminds me of this guy. Mark Zuckerberg can change a setting in his dashboard and ruin all of our privacy and ruin all of our lives without doing any work himself, right? So this is the Hashcash white paper that Adam published. I took my two favorite parts. Hashcash was originally proposed as a mechanism to throttle systemic abuse of unmetered internet resources. And Adam invented the cost function, a hash cost function. A cost function should be efficiently verifiable, but expensive to compute, okay? This was Adam's invention. So what are hash cost functions? Hash cost functions are brute forcing a random number and you get proof of work when you've solved it. What do hash cost functions require? Time and energy to solve. What are hash cost functions? Why are they important? They require physical resources to produce an abstract object, right? The entire point of Adam's invention is to impose a physical cost on an action in the abstract virtual world that isn't physically real. 
Are you guys getting where I'm going with this? Why are they fair? Because there are no shortcuts, because there are no progress. Every single random guess for a number stands on its own. So Adam created Hashcash to use hash cost functions to require proof of work to send an email. Or Adam required physical resources from the physical world to apply physical limits and physical constraints to an abstract virtual action. So proof of work connects the physical world that we're all in in this room to the virtual realm, right? Proof of work is reverse reification, where in reification, we're taking abstract objects and calling it a folder. We're treating it as if it's real. What Adam did, Adam created a computer program that takes physical energy and turns it into an abstract object. He did the opposite. So proof of work is actually the only physically real thing that any of us can see on any digital screen. So on this slide, if I'm looking into the camera, so those of you that are watching on YouTube, even me myself isn't physically real. There is only one physically real thing on your computer screen. It is not the file, it is not the folder, it is the proof of work. That is the proof of work from Bitcoin's first genesis block. That is proof of Satoshi Nakamoto's time and energy. Satoshi used a hash cost function to take real physical things from the world in time and energy and turned it into an abstract object. Does that make sense? Unbelievable invention, yeah? Okay, in order to understand proof of work, we gotta understand the abstract world we live in. Now that we understand proof of work, and that was the hardest part, thank you guys for bearing with me, now we can understand how Satoshi invented Bitcoin. So Adam invented proof of work in 1996. Satoshi invented Bitcoin in 2009. So proof of work wasn't the entire thing that we had to solve. There were a still, still more a, a few steps for that Satoshi had to put together. So let's walk through it. If we're going to create digital tokens, where do you track these digital tokens? A ledger in cyberspace, right? Fair enough. If we have a ledger in cyberspace, who gets to store that ledger? Everyone. So this is part of Satoshi's invention. Satoshi created a distributed network where we all get a copy of the ledger. If we all have the copy of the ledger, who gets to write to that ledger? Now this is the huge invention. Anyone gets to write to the ledger. The person that gets to update the ledger, which has all of our money on it. So imagine if Mark Zuckerberg had control over the ledger, or whoever, if I did, that would be a tremendous amount of abstract power to control everyone's money, right? The, what, what Satoshi did is anyone who solves the hash cost function and produces the proof of work gets to update the ledger of our digital tokens. So how do you defend against the threat of people trying to control a digital ledger? Well, in hindsight, it's pretty simple. You make the people that solve the hash cost function the people that can write to the ledger. And by doing that step, you're imposing physical real world costs to do a digital abstracted action. You protect digital cash with physical power. How hard is it to solve the hash cost function and produce the proof of work? Well, it depends. Satoshi designed the difficulty of the hash cost function to target a certain 10 minute output. And so, as Gigi said, difficulty adjusted proof of work is the innovation of Bitcoin. If we look at physical power, Satoshi's requiring and protecting Bitcoin with physical power, right? It's inclusive. We all have unlimited access to get power to protect the network. Everyone can solve the hash cost functions. It's decentralized, it's empowering, right? The only theoretical cons are that it's energy intensive, right? And there's risk of injury, okay? But here's a really important point about Bitcoin. Bitcoin's proof of work, this physical power that we use to protect Bitcoin, is electric. It's not kinetic. So the physical power isn't a gun. It isn't a weapon. It isn't a jet. It isn't a bomb. It's electric. 
So this physical power that we use to protect Bitcoin actually doesn't risk any injury at all. It's safe. That's why when we say Bitcoin's a peaceful movement, we're using peaceful physical power in electric energy to protect Bitcoin. And then I love this diagram from Jason Lowry. I broke it down because I doubt you guys are going to be able to read it. Jason said, every one of these assets carries a monetary premium that we defend with human lives. So real estate, oil, gold, equities, this is where all of our wealth is. And we defend it with physical power, like guns, like police, like locking people in prison, right? And he writes, by transporting their monetary premiums into cyberspace using digital synthetic commodities called Satoshis, we replace the cost of human life with the cost of an electricity to defend our stored wealth. So we're taking the physical power and the elect electricity expenditure of armies and guns and police, and we're replacing it with an electricity bill. And he ends it by saying, not having to waste human life to defend monetized wealth is worth every single watt. And so Bitcoin also can be thought of as not energy intensive, and it's safe, and it's peaceful. So Satoshi using proof of work is using physical power to defend an abstract reality without any of the cons. Does that make sense? It's mind-blowing what Satoshi created. And if computers are simply state machines and money is our time and energy in an abstracted form, then Bitcoin is a distributed state machine for our time and energy. Insane. Makes sense. Okay. Now, we can take all of that work and contrast it with altcoins. So we understand proof of work. We understand how vital proof of work is to creating Bitcoin. Proof of work is what connects Bitcoin to the physical world. Proof of work is that allows Bitcoin to be protected by physical power. Um, there are many ways to approach this. Uh, there are many differences between Bitcoin and altcoins. I'm going to stick to these three for this presentation. Um, and so first, link to reality. Given all of this context and given all of this presentation, I really want you guys to watch this video from the creator and leader of Ethereum. So I think I'd like to summarize that one of the ways that I think about this in a more philosophical way is like proof of work is uh, based on the laws of physics and so you sort of have to work with the world as it is right you have to work with you know electricity as it is hardware as it is what computers are um, as it is whereas because proof of stake is virtualized in this way it's basically letting us create a simulated universe that has its own laws of physics and that just gives the us as protocol developers a lot more freedom to optimize the system around actually having all of the uh, different uh, security properties that we want, right? And, you know, if we want it, the, the system to have a particular security guarantee, and then, like, often there is a way to modify the uh, proof of stake mechanism to also achieve it. So it's just, uh, you know, much more flexible, and it shows through in the uh, efficiency and the, the uh, security of the network. Okay. Proof of work is based on the laws of physics. So you have to work with the world as it is. You have to work with physical reality. <laughs> Whereas proof of stake is virtualized. In this way, it's basically letting us create a simulated universe that has its own laws of physics. <laughs> so we just spent the last half hour <laughs> I'm exhausted going through how the virtual world isn't physically real. Adam Back created a computer program to take the physical world and abstract it into a digital object. And Satoshi Nakamoto used that computer program to connect a digital money to the physical world and allow us humans to physically protect with physical power our digital money. <laughs> And these altcoins <laughs> said, screw the physical world. I want my own abstracted reality. <laughs> so there is no spoon. <laughs> right? <laughs> Proof 
of work is proof of real. Proof of stake is proof of rank, okay? Proof of stake is abstracted reality. And that abstracted reality, as we went over, yields a lot of abstracted power. So like when the US left the gold standard, they went from physical reality as being backed by gold and bounded to the physical constraints of the universe to an abstracted reality that can sanction any country and print money out of thin air. <laughs> These altcoins don't use proof of work. They are not bounded to the physical world. So they've gone from physical reality in the Ethereum merge to abstracted reality. Now, this is a trippy question you should ask yourself late at night. Is Ethereum physically real? <laughs> I don't know. If Vitalik is watching, I'm curious your answer. Security. Now, there's the reason I did this presentation, one of, is there's all this altcoin ETF hype and stuff, right? What ETF approval could mean for Ethereum? Here's another important point about security and proof of work in the physical world. There is nothing physically, so like this, physically, physical, preventing anyone from gaining control over a non-proof of work system, right? Think of it, look at abstract power again, okay? When Hitler tried to 51% attack planet Earth, and I know that's a crazy example, but it's a real one, all the honest actors in the system, all the honest humans on planet Earth were able to summon enough physical power to protect ourselves. So as long as the honest people in the system of humanity was able to summon enough physical power to thwart off an actor that tried to 51% attack us, we're safe. The same goes for Bitcoin in a proof of work system, right? Any BlackRock, any Michael Saylor that tries to attack us, it doesn't matter how many coins they have, we can physically protect ourselves because we're connected to the physical world with physical power, and we can do it in a way that's safe and energy efficient. Makes sense, right? In a proof of stake system, there is no unbounded way to protect yourself. It's proof of rank. You're trusting that the people high up are gonna follow the rules and do a good job. And so is Ethereum, this is a good question, is Ethereum under attack by Wall Street? There's nothing that's preventing BlackRock from buying up all of the Ethereum and then doing what they want, sanctioning a country off of the Ethereum network. There is no physical way for honest actors in the Ethereum network to protect themselves. Does that make sense, right? So Bitcoin is physical reality, and Ethereum is abstract reality. When you take yourself away from the physical world, honest people can't protect themselves. BlackRock can buy as much Bitcoin as they want. They cannot physically, they can't out-physical us. We can summon enough physical power to protect ourselves. It doesn't matter how many coins they have. That is not true in proof of stake. Proof of stake is subjected to no, there's, there's nothing physically preventing BlackRock from taking it over. And then the last one is equitable and fair. So this is just unbelievable. 60% um, of the current Ethereum supply was pre-mined. Ethereum pre-mined 72 million Ethereum, and there's only 120 million today. So the public Ethereum network actually hasn't even generated more Ethereum than they generated privately for themselves when they created it, right? This cartoon is amazing. Well, I left you half, right? It's power concentrates, and they now are in a proof of stake system where those who have the most coins gain the most benefit. So they printed the most coins for themselves, and then they changed the rules to give themselves tremendous amounts of abstract power to give themselves amazing benefits. Altcoins change the rules all the time. They change the monetary policy all the time, and they even reverse transactions. Right? So this is the DAO hack. When something goes wrong in Ethereum, they reverse it. So this quote from Greg Maxwell is amazing. The lesson Ethereum operators are teaching is implicitly this. When Vitalik's funds are lost due to a contract executed to the letter with unwelcome results, great choice. When Vitalik's funds are not lost, but an even larger dollar value is lost, then you don't reverse the, the blockchain. Then it's a bad choice. The point of all of this is it's not equitable and it's not fair. Ethereum does not live within the physical constraints and the physical realities of the universe. Ethereum and altcoins that are not on proof of work are abstract power. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. I got one more video to show you guys. I'm out of here. Here's my closing thoughts and why, why, I guess, why should this matter to us? I'm a Bitcoiner. Why do I care? You guys are Bitcoiners. Why do we care to explain the difference between Bitcoin and altcoins? I love this Greg Maxwell quote. Most of the altcoin industry is in the business of drawing a false equivalence between Bitcoin and their centralized, pre-mined, inflationary, recklessly constructed platforms, but they're supposed to be quote-unquote better because of some jargon that goes over people's heads. They're just like Bitcoin. <laughs> it has smart internet of world contract computing hypercube things that all the venture capitalists in Wall Street are so excited about. You better buy now or you better not miss out. Right? It's the last video I want to show you guys. What are the principal differences in Bitcoin spot ETF, Ether spot ETF? But I guess what we're actually asking is the principal difference between an Ethereum based blockchain and, and Bitcoin blockchain. So Bitcoin's digital gold, right? And so you can view the rigidness of its roadmap. There is no future roadmap for Bitcoin being either a feature of a bug or a bug in the sense that, you know, Bitcoin is going to be Bitcoin for the next hundred years. ETH is at the forefront of the tokenization movement that is going to really define the next few decades of traditional finance. We're going to start with the stable coins, the $100 billion of stable coins that are on chain today. But now BlackRock's bringing on fixed income. People are bringing on equities. People are bringing on commodities. People are bringing on private credit. And so ETH is at the forefront of that movement. And it's also just a very different asset. You know, it does about 2 to $3 billion of profits per year. It dividends those out. The asset itself is deflationary. You know, it's proof of stake. It's a very different asset than Bitcoin. I would say it's more of a textile growth play. And if Bitcoin is digital gold, ETH is Apple. It's building the app store of finance. And, and just like people thought that the app store was a toy or a gimmick 10 years ago, people are going to be really surprised at the uniqueness of the scale of the business that ETH is going to generate from the tokenization wave that's taking place. And it's Larry right. Fink, it's Paul Tudor Jones, it's all these guys, you know, they're all on this train. They're all on this train. It's like the digital Apple. We are in this abstracted world and we're doing all this shit that you'll never understand and all these rich people are buying it. You better get in now. Don't miss out. <laughs> Greg Maxwell ends his quote by saying, while we can't protect people, from making even the most extremely bad decisions, like storing your coins on FTX, taking a loan out on Celsius, believing Doquan. If we don't continually emphasize the distinctions, we'll share credibility loss with the various altcoins as they suffer problems from the myriad ways that they're not even remotely equivalent to Bitcoin. So while we Bitcoiners can't make decisions for you, we can educate you. To understand Bitcoin is to understand proof of work. Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency that uses proof of work. <laughs> there is no second best. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jack. Jack Mallis.